Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you again. This is Mylin from the respiratory department. In this class, we will learn a new chapter of the respiratory disease, the pleural disease. In Chinese, it's called Xiong Mo Ji Bing. There are two diseases in this chapter. The first one is the pleural effusion. In Chinese, it's called Xiong Qiang Ji Ye. In this class, we will learn about the introduction, clinical manifestation, auxiliary examinations, diagnosis, and treatment for the pleural effusion. In the end of this class, I will tell you some brief information about the um, pneumothorax. And now, let's look at the definition of the pleural effusion. Pleural effusion is any significant increase in the quantity of pleural fluid. Now, let's look at these pictures. We know that there are two layers of the pleura. One is called vesicle pleura which cover the superficial of the lungs. Another one is called parietal pleura, which cover the inside of the thorax. And in both layers of the pleura, there are many blood capillaries and lymphatics, which will produce the pleural fluid. And the pleural cavity is the potential space between these two layers of the pleura. Why we say it's the potential space? Because in the coma condition, we cannot find this potential space. But in the pathological condition, we can find this pleural cavity through the X-ray, CT scan, or ultrasound examinations in the patient with pleural effusion and pneumothorax. In normal conditions, there is a small amount of the pleural fluid in this potassium pleural cavity, which can lubricate in the relative movement of these two layers of the pleura during the respiration. And the pleural fluid usually comes from the blood capillaries in the pleura and um, reabsorbed by the lymphatics. This page shows the circulation of the pleural fluid. There is a negative intrapleural pressure, which caused by the negative intrathoracic pressure during the inspiration. And in the parietal pleural, the hydrostatic pressure in the blood capil capillaries is higher, so the flu will transfer into the pleural cavity. And the plasma oncotic pressure in the blood capillaries is higher than the oncotic pressure in the pleural fluid. So, some fluid can be reabsorbed into the um, capillaries and lymphatics. It's the same to the um, Visceral pleural. To consider the superposition of these effects, the pleural flu will finally be produced by the parietal pleural.
that's the circulation of the pleural fluid in the physiological condition. But in the pathological condition, um, the following three mechanisms will result in the pleural effusion. The first one is the increased hydrostatic pressure, which will cause more water transferring into the pleural cavity. And the second one is the decreased plasma oncotic pressure. Let's notice here. In these two mechanisms, we can find the wall of these vessels integrated, right? That will mean only the water and small molecular substance, substance can transfer in and out of these vessels. And the large molecular substance in the blood vessels and lymphatics cannot transfer out from these vessels. And finally, the pleural effusion will belong to the transudate. The third mechanism of the pleural effusion is the increased capillary permeability. As the picture showing, we can find the um, walls of the vessels is not integrated caused by the disease and the large molecular substance can transfer out of the vessels and finally to form the exudate. And now let's look at these three mechanisms one by one. Firstly, let's look at the decreased capillary permeability. It's caused by the injury in the basement membrane of the vessels. Because of the increased capillary permeability, there will be a leakage of the large um, molecular substance such as the proteins and blood cells into the pleural cavity. Once there is a large injury in the vessels, there will be a calothorax or hemothorax caused by the injured of the lymphatics and the blood capillaries. The causes of the increased capillary permeability include inflammations. It's easy for us to understand the inflammations caused by the infection of the bacterial and tuberculosis. Those are belongs to the um, specific inflammation. But we cannot neglect the non-specific information, including the connective tissue disease, autoimmune disease, pancreatitis, and so on, which can damage the basement membrane of the vessels by the autoantibodies and inflammatory mediators. The second one is the cancer, including the primary cancer and secondary cancer. The primary cancer of the pleural mesothelioma and the secondary cancer including the metastasis by many kinds of the cancer, such as lung cancer, breast cancer, and so on. Cancers usually erode the wall of the vessels 
directly by the、um, perforation of this the cancer tissue, and finally it will cause a bloody pleural effusion. The last causes is the trauma, which can damage the wall of the vessels directly. Usually, there will be a chylothorax caused by the、um, injured in the thoracic duct, and the hemoneothorax will occur in the severe injured in the lungs. The second mechanism of the pleural effusion is the increased hydrostatic pressure. It will occur once there is a obstruction in the downstream of the veins. Because of the integrity wall of the vessels, only the water and small A molecular substance can pass through the vessels and form the transudate. The causes of this pleural effusion usually include right heart failure, vessel obstructed by the thrombus, and embolism, cancer. And the enlarged organs, which can press the wall of the vessels directly. The third mechanism of the pleural effusion is the decreased plasma oncotic pressure. The plasma oncotic pressure is made up by the albumin mainly, and others, including the Macro molecular proteins, and so on. Once the concentration of this albumin and other macro molecular protein decreased, less water will be reabsorption from the pleural cavity, and because of the Integrity wall of the vessels. The large molecular proteins cannot pass through the wall into the pleural cavity, so there will be a transudate. The causes of this pleural disease usually include any disease result in the. Hypoalbuminemia, including the malnutrition, hepatic failure, nephrotic syndrome, and so on. That's the pathogenesis and causes for the pleural effusion. Next, let's move to the clinical manifestation of the pleural effusion. Firstly, let's look at the symptoms. I know that lots of symptoms of the pleural effusion have been described in your textbook, and it's confusing, right? But we can try to analyze the mechanisms of the symptoms and try to divide them into different groups. That will help our understanding. Of these symptoms, and now let's do this together. The symptoms can be divided into two groups. The first group is called main symptoms, including the chest pain and dyspnea. This main symptoms is caused by the effusion directly in pathological condition. Once there is a small amount of effusion, and the pleural will become rose because of the disease, and in this condition, the two layers of the pleural will wrap 
each other. That's why the patients with a small amount of effusion will get chest pain. And on the other side, if the quantity of the effusion become large, and the two layers of the pleura will be separated by this large amount of effusion, and the two layers of the pleura cannot wrap each other because of far away from each other. And that's why in these patients with a large amount of effusion will not get chest pain. In this condition, the patients with a large amount of effusion will get dyspnea because the effusion will occupy the lower position of the lungs and the lung expansion will be infected. Less air will be inhaled into the lungs and the patient will feel dyspnea because of lack of the oxygen. And that's the main symptoms caused by the effusion directly. And another group of the symptoms is called combining symptoms, which is associated to the causes of the pleural effusion. It's about the symptoms caused by the primary disease. For example, if the pleural effusion is the paraneumonic effusion, the patients will got other symptoms with the pneumonia, including the fever, cough, sputum, and so on. We just learned about why do the pneumonia patient will get chest pain in the class of the pneumonia, right? And if the pleural effusion is caused by the infection of the tuberculosis, um, the patients usually combining with a pulmonary tuberculosis with the symptoms including the low fever, cough, night sweat, weight loss, and so on. And others including the symptoms caused by the lung cancer, hyperalbuminemia, right heart failure, and so on. Those are the second group of the symptoms associated to the causes. I hope you can do a summary by yourself after class so that you can remember these symptoms of the pleural effusion systematically. About the signs, the positive signs of this patient are usually different from the quantity of the pleural effusion. In small amount group, we usually find no positive signs during the inspection and percussion of the lungs. But during the palpation, we usually can find the positive results of the pleural friction parameters. And the same in the auscultation, the pleural friction wrap usually present positive. In many cases, we will find normal breath sound in both lungs. But in a few cases of the patient with more effusion, we will find decreased breath sound in the lower lungs. In the moderate amount group, the intercostal gaps will increase, and the vocal parameters in the lower lungs usually decrease. The percussion nodes of the lower lungs usually present um, flatness or um, darkness and the uh, breath sound in the lower lungs usually decreased but please pay attention to here the breath sound in the upper lungs usually increased because of the compressive atelectasis 
in the patients with a large amount of effusion. We usually can find a significant increase in the costal space. And the vocal parameters of the affected side will disappear during the percussion. The percussion node will change into darkness or flatness. And finally, during the auscultation, we usually can find the breath sound disappeared. Other signs, including the vital signs, the increase of the pulse and the respiratory rate, usually caused by the compression of the infusion to the lungs and mediastin. Sinusis usually shows the lack of the oxygen. Displacement of the trachea usually occurs in the patients with a moderate or large amount of the effusion and other signs caused by the primary disease. For example, if the patient got a pleural effusion caused by the right heart failure, we usually can find the distension of the jangular wings and edema in the lower limbs caused by the right heart failure. That's the symptoms and signs for the pleural effusion. Those are the signs and symptoms of the patients with pleural effusion. According to the characteristics of the symptoms and signs, we can suspect a pleural effusion and its primary disease in this condition. We need to arrange some auxiliary examinations for this patient to confirm our diagnosis. Firstly, let's look at the radiologic examinations for this patient. We will find some special radiologic findings in the X-ray, CT scan, or ultrasonic examination. Now, let's look at the X-ray and CT scan of this patient. This picture shows the stimulated image of the small amount of effusion. We can find the fluid gathering in the costal phrenic angle. Now, let's look at the image of the X-ray for a specific patient. What can we find in this image? Yes, let's look at the costal phrenic angles. They are different, right? Yes. The red arrow shows a small amount of the effusion in the costal phrenic angle. And in the CT scan, we can also find the infusion in the right thorax. What else can we find in this CT scan? Okay, let's look at here. What's this? Yes, it's a mass in the breast. The final diagnosis for this patient is breast cancer with pleural metastasis. All of these pictures show the small amount of pleural effusion. Please notice here, the location of the check here is normal. Now, let's look at another two pictures for the patients. The first one is x-rayed. What can we find from this image? 
Yes, we can find some abnormal density opacity in the right lower lumps, right? It's the pleural effusion. And in the CT scan, we can also find the pleural effusion in the right thorax. Those are the moderate amount of effusion. And please notice here. What about the location of the trachea? The trachea has been compressed to the unaffected side. What can we find from these two pictures? Okay, in the X-ray, we can find the left thorax is filled with a large amount of effusion. And uh, check here, it's tied to the unaffected side of the thorax. The CT scan shows another patient, also with a large amount pleural effusion in the right thorax. Those are the large amount of effusion. Let's look at another picture. What can we find from them? Okay, let's look at the x-ray firstly. Here, we can find an opacity with high density in the left lung under the thorax, right? And the CT scan shows another patient. There is an opacity with high density in the right lungs under the thorax, right? Are those cancers? No, in fact, it's not cancer, but encapsulated effusion. Let's look at here. Here shows a tail of this opacity. And here, these tails shows the effusion fixed to the thorax by the capsule. And those are the encapsulated effusion. Another two pictures, what can we find from them? Let's look at the x-ray. Can you find this opacity in the right lung? Yes, it looks like a nodule. It's on the level of the horizontal fissure of the right lung. And we can also find that the tails of this opacity. So this opacity is not a nodule or a tumor, but a interlobar fissure infusion, which is a special subtype of the encapsulated effusion. And this CT scan also shows the interlobar fissure infusion at the oblique fissure of the right lung. The last two pictures of the X-ray and CT scan what can we find from them? Yes, I have marked here and here. Those are the eye flow level, which will show the hydronumor thorax. If the effusion is blooded, we can also call it hemonumor thorax. And those are the radiologic findings during the X-ray and CT scan. This page shows the 
ultrasonography of the pleural effusion. Let's look at here. The black area shows the pleural effusion. And here is the liver. This area shows the L in the lung. This picture also shows the image of the pleural effusion under the ultrasound, but different from other common image. We can find some cells in the effusion, right? The cells. Those will present an encapsulated effusion. Now, let's move to the laboratory examinations for the pleural effusion. The most important one is the pleural effusion analysis. There are several examinations during this analysis. One is the routine test, including the appearance, gravity, seal count, and classification of the seals for the pleural effusion. The second one is the biochemical tests, including the concentration of the LDH, ADA, glucose, and so on. Other tests for the effusion including the bacterial smear and culture. Tumor markers including the CA, NSE, and so on. And finally, the cytology to search for the tumor cells in the effusion. Those are the tests for the effusion analysis. This page shows the differences between transudate and exudate, including the items during the routine test and the biochemical test. Now, think about this question. Can we diagnose a transudate or exudate following this table? For example, if there is a patient with some items of the effusion feed transudate and other items of the effusion feed exudate, is it transudate or exudate? Okay, in this condition, we cannot diagnose the um, transudate or exudate according to this table, because most patients will feed the items both of transudate and exudate. In this condition, we need more accurate diagnostic criteria for the transudate and exudate. That is, LIGHTS criteria. Is the diagnostic criteria for the transudate and exudate. There are three points in this LIGHTS criteria. The first one is the protein ratio of the effusion to serum, which will show the large molecular protein transferred into the pleural effusion. The second point is about the concentration of the LDH in the pleural effusion. More than two-thirds the upper limitation of the normal serum LDH. And the third point is about the LDH ratio of the effusion to the serum, more than 0 0.6. And how to confirm the transudate and exudate? For the transudate, the effusion do not feed 
any criteria of the lights criteria. Once the effusion fit any one of these three criteria, we can diagnose an exudate. That's the diagnostic criteria for the transudate and exudate. About other examinations for the pleural effusion analysis, there are some notes for you to understand the meanings of the test items. Firstly, we should notice that exudate is caused by the injury injury in basement membrane of the vessels and the transudate is with integrated basement memory of the vessels. The cells count and classification are the most important items during the routine test of the effusion. If the cell count is higher than the normal condition. We need to analyze the classification of the seals. The seals can be divided into two groups. One is the multinuclear seals, which comes from the neutrophilis. And another one is the mononuclear seals, which comes from the lymphocyte tissue cells, tumor cells, and so on. So, once there is a patient with a high ratio of the multinuclear cells in the effusion, and we can suspect a bacterial pleuritis. But for another patient, once we find high ratio of the mononuclear cells in the effusion. We need to consider the suspicion of the tuberculosis, cancer, and other disease. That's the cells in the effusion. The LDH is not only a diagnostic criteria for the exudate and transudate, but a clue for the primary disease of the effusion. The obvious increase of the LDH usually suggests a severe inflammation and pyothorax in the pleura. The level of the ADA is a very specific items for the tuberculosis. Once the level of the ADA more than 40 unit per liter, it will suggest an active tuberculosis. Glucose, which is the basic energy for the cells and bacteria, is associated to the life activities. Therefore, we can find the abnormal decrease of the glucose in lung cancer and infection because of the significant increase of the life activities. Other blood tests include inflammatory markers such as white blood cell, CRP, ESR, PCT, and so on. Plasma biochemical tests, including the um, kidney and liver functions. Tumor markers, including the CEA, NSE, and so on. Other tests for the case scanning is also important for some special cases, such as the autoantibodies for the connective tissue or autoimmune um, disease. The BMP 
is very important for the patient with right heart failure. And uh, D-dimer is for the patient with a suspicion of um, thrombus or embolisms. Other examinations, including the pleural biopsy through the thoracosynthesis or through the thoracoscopy. This picture shows the thoracoscopy. Firstly, we ask the patient to lie on the unaffected side and do a tiny incision. Next, we insert the endoscope through this incision. And there is a camera in the terminal of this endoscope. We can watch the video of the pleural real time. And this picture shows the parietal pleural under the camera. We can find some abnormal change on the pleural. In this time, we can take some tiny tissue out of the body to do the pathological examination for this patient. And that is the biopsy. In some cases, it's important for us to arrange bronchoscopy for this patient with some opacity in lumps. And that's the um, auxiliary examinations for the patients with pleural effusion. Now, let's move to the diagnosis. There are two steps for this pleural effusion patient. The step one is to confirm whether the patient with or without effusion. And step two, to confirm the causes of this pleural effusion, that is the primary disease. Let's look at the diagnostic process. Firstly, from the symptoms and signs of the patient, we can suspect the exist of the pleural effusion. The symptoms including the chest pain or dyspnea. The signs are different from the quantity of the effusion. In this condition, we need to arrange some auxiliary examinations for this patient to confirm whether did the patient get a um, pleural effusion or not. We can use the ultrasonography, x-ray or CT scan to confirm the existence of the pleural effusion. And next, if, if we confirm the exist of the pleural effusion, we need to divide them into two groups. One is the patient with unilateral effusion. In this condition, we need to do a effusion analysis firstly to scan for the causes of the effusion, including the routine test bacteriological examinations, tumor markers, and finally the cytology. If we can confirm the causes of the effusion, for example, if a patient with a high ratio of the neutrophilic cells in the effusion during the routine test and the level of the glucose increased significantly during the biochemical tests. And sometimes we can also find the um, positive results during the um, effusion culture. 
In this condition, we can confirm the diagnosis of the bacterial pleuritis. And as the condition, we can confirm the causes by the effusion analysis. Once we cannot confirm the causes of the effusion by the effusion analysis, we need to move to the last examination, that is the pleural biopsy. That's the diagnostic process for the patients with unilateral effusion. In the other side, for the patients with bilateral effusion, we usually consider about the systematic disease firstly, such as the right heart failure, connective tissue, hyperalbuminemia, and so on. We can do the auxiliary examinations to exclude or confirm this disease. And next, we can um, treat the patient firstly by the diuretics or supplying the albumin and do the evaluation after treatment. If the effusion decreased or disappeared after treatment, we can confirm the causes again and ask the patient to follow up. But if the treatment failed, they need to enter the diagnostic process of the unilateral effusion, that is, to do the effusion analysis. And finally, to do the pleural biopsy for this patient. And that's the diagnostic process for the patients with bilateral effusion. The differential diagnosis is usually about the primary diagnosis of the pleural effusion. The first one is the perineumonic pleural effusion or pyothorax which caused by the bacterial infection. Tubercular pleuritis caused by the infection of the tuberculosis. Primary cancers in the pleura or pleural metastasis from other cancers. Right heart failure. Any cause of the hypoalbuminemia. Connective tissue disease. And others. Those are the differential diagnoses for the pleural effusion. Let's look at some specific primary disease of the pleural effusion. This page shows the characteristics of the pyroneumonic pleural effusion or pyothorax. The symptoms of these patients usually present high fever because of severe infection and respiratory symptoms such as cough, sputum, and others. The pleural effusion of the pneumonia usually shows the severe condition of the pneumonia. And the signs are the same to the pneumonia patient and the patients with pleural effusion. During the auxiliary examinations, we can find unilateral effusion in the X-ray or CT scan and the encapsulated effusion usually occurs in the patients with pyothorax in the early stage. 
The laboratory examinations usually present the severe increasing of the inflammatory markers, such as the white blood cell count, CRP, PCT, and so on. And during the effusion analysis, we can conclude an SU date in this patient. The more details about effusion, including the increase of the cell count with most multinuclear cells, that means the um, neutrophilis. In the biochemical test, we can find a uh, um, obvious increase of the LDH and decrease of the glucose. Sometimes, maybe we can find the positive results during the bacterial smear or culture. Other examination, including the blood culture, is important for this patient. Tubercular protitis is also a popular disease in the patients with young age. And the symptoms of this tubercular pleuritis include low fever. And this fever usually occurs in the afternoon or on night. Night sweet, weight loss, and other respiratory symptoms such as cough, sputum, and sometimes with he hemopatitis. The signs are the same to the um, pleural effusion and pulmonary tuberculosis. Under the radiologic examinations, the effusion usually shows um, unilateral or encapsulated in the tubercular pleuritis. And during the laboratory examinations, the increase of the ESR is a specific item in the patients with tobacular pruritis and with other inflammatory markers normal. The infusion analysis for this patient usually present exudate. More details during the effusion analysis, including the significant increase of the cell count in the effusion with mostly mononuclear cells, which are the T cells activated by the tuberculosis. And during the biochemical test, we usually can find significant increase of the ADA. In a few cases, we can also find a acid fast positive bacilli during the um, effusion smear. For this patient, we need other examinations to confirm the diagnosis of the infection by the tuberculosis, including the PBD test, pleural biopsy, and so on. This page shows the characteristics of the pleural effusion caused by the cancers. The symptoms of this patient usually include weight loss, enlargement of the superficial lymph nodes, and local symptoms for the cancer, such as cough and hemoptysis caused by the lung cancer. And the signs for this patient usually caused by the pleural effusion and the local cancers. During the auxiliary examinations, we can find the um, effusion is unilateral during the radiologic examinations. And during, in the laboratory examinations, we usually can find a significant increase in the tumor markers. 
for the effusion analysis. The appearance of the effusion usually presents bloody, bloody acidate. During the routine test, we can find a significant increase of the silicon with mostly mononuclear cells caused by the tumor cells. And during the biochemical test, we can find a slight increase in the LDH and significant decrease of the glucose. Other effusion tests, including the positive results of the cytologic and increase of the level of the tumor marker in the effusion. For this patient, we usually need other examinations include the tumor markers in the serum and the pleural biopsy or other radiologic examinations for the local cancer and biopsy for the local cancers. This page shows the characteristics of the pleural effusion caused by the right heart failure. The symptoms for this patient usually include the edema in lower limbs and loss of the appetite caused by the congestion of the systematic venous system. And the signs for this patient usually include the distension of the jangular wing and the edema in the lower limbs which caused by the right heart failure. During the radiologic examinations, we usually can find the bilateral effusion and the enlargement of the right heart. The laboratory examination usually shows the increase of the BMP. During the effusion analysis, we can conclude a transfer date because of the integrated wall of the vessels. During the routine tests, biochemical tests, and other effusion tests, we cannot find any positive results during these tests. For this patient, we usually need other examinations include echocardiogram, and other tests for the cause of the right heart failure. Now, let's move to the treatment for this patient. The approaches of the treatment is the same to other disease we have learned before. There are three parts in the treatment. Part 1, treatment for the cause, that means treatment for the primary disease of the pleural effusion. Part 2, treatment for the symptoms, mainly for the symptoms caused by the pleural effusion, including the um, chest pain, dyspnea, and so on. And part 3, treatment for the comorbidities. Now, let's look at the first part, treatment for the primary disease. We can provide antibiotics for the pneumonia or pyothorax, antitubercular therapy for the tubercular pleuritis, chemotherapy or target therapy for the cancers, diuretics for the right heart failure, and neuter nutritional supporting treatment for the hypoalbuminemia, glucocorticoids or other disease for the connective tissue disease, and so on. And that's the um, first part of the treatment, treatment for the primary disease. Part two, treatment for the symptoms that is the treatment for the pleural effusion. In this part, 
we need to focus on the Dorsen tenses with pleural effusion drainage or pleural chemotherapy. This picture shows the Dorsen tenses. The infusion can be dropped by the syringe directly in the patients with a small amount or moderate amount of the pleural effusion. But um, if uh, there is a large amount of the pleural effusion, the drainage tube is necessary for this patient to drain the infusion continuously. If the patients get cancer with a pleural metastasis, in this condition, we can inject some chemotherapy drugs into the pleural cavity to control the production of the pleural effusion, such as the cis platinum, and that's the treatment for the pleural effusion. Now, let's move to another contents of this class, pneumothorax. The pneumothorax is defined by the air in the pleural space. There are several methods of the classifications for the pneumothorax, and the following two methods of the classifications are most popular. According to the causes, they can be divided into three types. One is the um, traumatic pneumothorax. The second one is the iatrogenic pneumothorax. For example, the pneumothorax after the jangular wing catheterization. Spontaneous pneumothorax. And another matter of the classification is according to the clinical manifestation, including the closed or simple pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, and tension pneumothorax. This page shows the characteristics of the each types of the pneumothorax according to the clinical manifestations because there are several differences among these three types about the um, symptoms, signs, um, severity of the pneumothorax and the treatment for the pneumothorax. So we need to keep the characteristics of each types of the pneumothorax in our mind. Let's look at the first one, closed pneumothorax. The leakage of the air will not reopen. In this condition, there will be a small or moderate amount of the air in the thorax, and the patient usually get mild or moderate severity of the dyspnea. And during the physical examinations, the vital signs are usually normal, and the medial stenum usually um, without displacement or with a slightly displacement. And the treatment for this patient is according to the quantity of the air. In some cases, with a small amount of the pneumothorax, the single monitoring is enough for this patient. And in other cases, with a moderate amount of the pneumothorax, the simple generage of the air is also enough for this patient. The second time, of the pneumothorax is the open pneumothorax with the air communication opening in all time. Because of the communication in and out of the 
thorax. The affected side of the thorax is filled with the air, and the affected side of the lung will be depressed. In this condition, these patients usually get a severe dyspnea with chest pain, and during the physical examinations, we can find a normal or slightly change in the vital signs, and there is no displacement in the medial stenum because of the pressures in and out of the thorax is nearly the same. For these patients, we can provide a prolonged dorsentesis with air drainage by catheter. But if this therapy is failed, this patient will need a surgery. And the third type of the pneumothorax is the tension pneumothorax with one-way wave. That means the air can only get in the thorax only, but cannot get out from the thorax. So, um, the intra-thorax pressure will increase significantly, and the medial stenum will displace because of the significant increasing of the um, intrathoracic pressure. So, in this condition, these patients are in danger because of the um, significant changes of their vital signs, such as the decreased blood pressure. And in this condition, we need to provide the supporting treatment for this patient and um, rapidly to turn the tension pneumothorax into the open pneumothorax. For this patient, the surgery is necessary. That's the three types of the pneumothorax according to the clinical manifestation. The clinical manifestation of the pneumothorax, including the symptoms such as sudden dyspnea, chest pain, and sometimes the patient will be in coma because of the hypoxia. The signs include the vital signs such as the increased pulse, increased respiratory rate, and decrease of their blood pressure in the patients with tension pneumothorax. During the physical examinations of the thorax, we can find the increased intercostal space during the inspection. And during the palpation, we can find the affected size of the vocal parameters increase. And during the um, percussion, we can find the percussion note change into the timpani. And during the auscultation, the affected side of the lungs will be with a increased breath sound in the upper lungs, especially in the apex. Um, other extra pulmonary signs include displacement of the trachea, pneumodon, and sinusis. Now, let's look at some image of the radiologic examinations for this pneumothorax patient. Let's look at the first x-ray. As the red arrow showing, we can find a line parallel the curves of the thorax, which shows the boundary of the right lung. And this area shows the pneumothorax. Here is another x-ray for the pneumothorax patient. Comparing these two sides of the thorax, we can find 
there is no long markings in the left side because of the um, filled with the air. And here shows a mess near the leader stinger. It's not a mess, but the left lung. We can also find the displacement of the check here and the medial stinger. Here shows the right heart. The treatment for the pneumothorax also include three approaches. Treatment for the cause, such as the surgery for the trauma, bleed of the lungs, and so on. Um, the second approach is the treatment for the symptoms. That means treatment for the pleural air, including the monitoring with oxygen therapy, simple aspiration drainage, thoracentesis with air drainage by catheter, pleural diesis or surgery. And the third approach is the treatment for comorbidities such as a shock. We need to maintain the blood pressure for this patient with a shock and so on. That's the treatment for the pneumothorax. Now let's do a summary for this class. In this class, the most important contents include the symptoms and signs of the pleural effusion and pneumothorax, the light diagnosis for the pleural effusion, and the characteristics of each pleural effusion, the classification of the pleural effusion and pneumothorax, and finally the radiologic changes in the pleural effusion or pneumothorax. Okay, that's all for this class. Thank you.